Hello everyone, this is Direwolf20, and welcome to my mod spotlight on Thermal Expansion 3. Thermal Expansion has been completely rewritten. It has a bunch of different new items, a bunch of different new blocks. Some of our old favorites are, of course, back, and some changes to some functionality, like Tesseracts have changed quite a bit. So it's time for me to do a mod spotlight showing you guys everything there is to know about Thermal Expansion. We're going to cover how to generate power, how to store power, and then how to use power. We're going to look at item ducts and fluid ducts and a bunch of other stuff. So without further ado, let's start taking a look at what you need to do to get started with thermal expansion. Alright guys, so at the center of thermal expansion is an energy source or an energy system called Redstone Flux, or RF for short. There's a bunch of different ways to create, store, and transmit Redstone Flux. So basically you've got uh, dynamos, there's four of them that come with thermal expansion that can be used to generate Redstone Flux using many different methods. You've got energy cells, which we'll get into in a minute, that can store Redstone Flux. And then finally you've got uh, machines that will use the Redstone Flux, so things like furnaces and pulverizers and that kind of cool stuff. And then finally, you've got um, three methods of transmitting redstone flux, which is the leadstone, hardened, and uh, redstone energy conduits. And they can all uh, have different qualities to them. So let's start off talking about how to generate some energy using thermal expansion. So the first thing you might want to look into is the steam dynamo. This is your most basic and simple form of generating energy, okay? Um, so what you can do is in here, you need to place some water and some kind of solid fuel. So if we were to get ourselves a water bucket, for example, and just right click on this guy, you would see that now there's water right inside the uh, right hand slot here. Next we'll need to put some basic fuel in, so something like coal. You could also use charcoal or coal coke. Um, all these have different metrics of how much energy you can get. So from coal you get about 32,000 redstone flux energy from um, the steam dynamo per piece of coal. You get 24,000 for charcoal and you get 48,000 for coal coke. So if I were to put some coal in here for example it'll start running and we'll start generating some steam. Cool. And please disregard the fact that the texture on Steam is broken. That's not, um, that's not the fault of um, thermal expansion. There's just some conflict with mods here. Now you'll also notice something pretty interesting. That the more energy that's stored in the Steam Dynamo's internal buffer, the lower the power output. So these Steam Dynamo's will all kind of self-regulate themselves. They won't completely shut themselves off at any point, but they will slow down so that they stop using quite as much energy. Uh, so it'll slowly, slowly drop down and instead of constantly burning the fuel at full blast, it'll lower itself and use less. So eventually we'll wind up with a decent amount of energy in here. We've got about 40,000 that the steam dynamo can build and hold. At max power it'll create 80 RF per tick. Look good? Your next option for power generation is the magmatic dynamo. Now this guy is a little bit harder to make, but he can run on two liquids, either lava, which you get about 180,000 redstone flux per bucket, or you can get blazing pyrothium, which is some really powerful and crazy, intense, massive amount of energy, two million redstone flux per bucket. It's really some pretty great stuff. Now, of course, it is a little bit harder to make blazing pyrothium than lava in any large amount, but you'll see here that just like the last dynamo, it's going to self slow itself down, so it's not going to be quite as fast as it starts to build up its internal buffer. But this blazing pyrothium will really last a long time. Or you can go with straight up lava from the nether. It's really a good way to get early game power is the magmatic dynamo. Now, the only difference between these two dynamos, of course, is their item cost. Magmatic dynamos require requires invar ingots, which are a little bit trickier to make. It's a component of uh, thermal expansion. Your best bet for invar is to combine two iron dust or pulverized iron with some pulverized ferrous metal. And I'll show you how to get pulverized items in just a moment. Your next option for power is the compression dynamo. This guy can run off of liquefacted coal, which is a liquefied version of coal added by thermal expansion. It can also run off of fuel, uh, which is from Buildcraft, or oil from Buildcraft, or ethanol or biomass from Forestry, or biofuel from Minecraft, Mine Factory Reloaded. So there's a bunch of different uh, liquid fuels available throughout the different mods, and these are what's available. Now with the compression dynamo, you actually have to cool down the compression dynamo along with uh, generating the power. So there's two ways to to do that. You can either use uh, water, which will help to keep the thing cool, or you can use something called gelid cryothium. And the gelid cryothium is again produced by thermal expansion. It's a little in-depth, but I'll show you guys how to make it. It's really not too bad. Um, it's just a better, more efficient coolant. So with water, it'll keep it cool. Um, you'll basically be able to um, produce energy using uh, a lot less gelid cryothium versus water. But water is obviously a lot easier to make. 
Now I'm not going to go into which of these different fuels makes exactly how much energy, but just obviously keep in mind that, you know, fuel is going to be pretty much your best bet, liquefacted coal is your second best bet, and then, um, you know, ethanol, oil, and biofuel are all options as well. You can check out on the FTB wiki, there's a list of how much of each of these you can get. Now the final type of engine that's available is the reactant dynamo. This one's a little bit different, and I'm going to go into how these work now. Now the reactant dynamo is dependent upon a reaction between certain liquids and certain items. And depending on which item or liquid you put in determines how much energy it produces. For example, if you want to run this thing off of creosote oil from Railcraft, it would produce 200,000 redstone flux per bucket. But you'd need to combine it with some kind of reactant. If you used sugar, for each piece of sugar that you put in, you'd get about 16,000 redstone flux. So you're going to need quite a bit of sugar to be able to use up all the 200,000 of uh, redstone flux that the creosote can allow. Gunpowder, on the other hand, is 160,000, so 10 times as effective as gunpowder uh, as sugar is. So you'd be able to get 160,000 redstone flux per piece of gunpowder. Cool, makes sense. Blaze powder, 640,000. And then finally, you could use another star if you really wanted to, and that would be 6.4 million redstone flux. So you wouldn't have to put too many nether stars in here too often. You'd be getting a lot of energy out of them. Um, but, you know, that's the type of uh, system you can get. You can produce energy for, with uh, destabilized redstone, so you could actually run your power plant off of redstone if you really wanted to. You get a good amount of energy from this guy, 600,000 redstone flux. Energized glowstone is even more redstone flux. And then you could also use biomass, creosote, mob essence, and you could even use sewage and sludge from uh, Mine Factor Reloaded. Um, but the deal with this stuff is that it's um, much less energy. I think you only get about 16,000 uh, redstone flux from your sewage bucket. So all you gotta do is uh, plop your uh, liquid into there, We'll get about 16,000 out of this, and a piece of sugar, which also is about 16,000. You can see it ate the sugar, and it's going to burn through the sewage very quickly. If we wanted to throw some uh, destabilized redstone in there, once it's finished burning up, it's 16,000 worth of energy. There it goes. Um, yep, so we see we've got a little bit of sewage left. We could probably throw another piece of sugar in there, or we could go with uh, gunpowder, which would obviously last a lot longer. So now I dropped some uh, destabilized redstone in there. You can see it's still uh, generating some energy. And uh, we'll throw gunpowder in, and it's going to be a lot more effective at producing the energy. So those are your options. You've got quite a few different ways to make energy with this mod. Um, now, in order to transmit your energy, you're going to need to get a leadstone energy conduit. That's the lowest form of energy transfer. You can see it's really easy to make. Just some redstone, some lead, and some kind of glass in the center. And you'll get six of those guys. Now, uh, these are pretty low, and you can hold shift here to see details. It can only transfer about 80 RF per tick. So the deal with this is, if you have this connected to one engine that's producing, you guessed it, 80 RF per tick, you're going to be just fine. But if you try and hook this up to multiple engines, you're really not going to be able to transmit that much energy. Let's take a look. Let's take a look also at storing your energy. So for this, you have a bunch of different options for energy cells. Again, your most basic is the leadstone energy cell. It's going to be able to hold about 400,000 redstone flux. Let's take a look at storing some energy right now. All you have to do in order for this to work is place this guy on the ground. You'll note that there's a couple different sides to this block, and pay attention to this part because this is going to hold true for a lot of different um, aspects of this mod. If you click on the green configuration button, you'll be able to see which sides are accepting or receiving power and which sides are outputting power. Anything with a blue set is going to be receiving power. So let's connect our power from the reactant dynamo here and connect this conduit into one of the blue sides like that. It's now going to be receiving power at a maximum rate of 80 redstone flux per tick. So that's the most it can receive because the leadstone energy cell is the lowest here. You can see this guy is happily transmitting its 80,000 or its 80 RF per tick. So now that we're draining the internal buffer here, it's quickly sending energy out and it's uh, you know able to produce more and more over time. Neat. Let's wait for this to completely subside. So as you can see, we're producing a lot of energy. Now, if we tried to store more than 80 RF per tick at a time in this leadstone energy cell, we wouldn't be able to because its maximum input rate is 80 RF per tick. So let's get a new cell here. Let's remove this one, and we can go ahead and place down a hardened energy cell. Best way to move anything, by the way, is using the crescent hammer, which is the tool from thermal expansion. Shift right click to remove it. And we'll place down the hardened energy cell. This is an upgraded version of the leadstone energy cell. You just need to surround it with invar ingots. This guy's a lot better. He can store up to 200,000 or 2 million redstone flux per tick. And he can uh, also send and receive 400 redstone flux. So much better, much more efficient. So this guy can receive a lot more, but he's still only receiving 80 because that's all that we have the engine hooked up to. 
If we tried to hook up using leadstone conduits to another engine, for example, this one over here, we would see that it's not able to transmit more than 80 still because that's all the leadstone energy conduits can transfer. So what we're gonna need to do is close out and remove all of these leadstones and replace them with hardened energy cells. Hardened energy cells are the second tier of energy transfer. Um, they're created just by adding a little bit of invar to your leadstone energy cells and some redstone. They can transfer 400 redstone flux per tick. So much more efficient at transferring energy. And now we'll be able to convert a lot more energy and store it in this cell a lot faster. See how much faster the cell's filling up? Because both of these are rapidly draining. So these engines can't nearly keep up with the amount of drain that we've got on it. They're able to produce ADRF per tick, and they're completely emptying out their internal capacitors. Finally, your top tier is your redstone energy conduit, which can store or transfer 10,000 redstone flux per tick. That's the most efficient um, transfer method, and it can store the most at a time. We've also got redstone energy cells and resonant energy cells. Redstone energy cells uh, can store uh, quite a bit, 10 million redstone flux and your resonant energy cell can store 50 million redstone flux. There's one more energy cell that is available, and it's called the creative energy cell. Now this does not have a crafting recipe, so there's no way to craft this item. It's a creative mode only item, but it's basically unlimited energy. So if you're building some kind of map, or if you have some kind of uh, nifty contraption, or if you're just in a test world and want to test out different builds, you can go ahead and use the creative energy cell to constantly um, send out plenty of energy. You can also adjust on the interfaces here how much of an input or output you want. So if you want to restrict this guy so that you can only receive maybe 100 flux at a time, you can easily do that. Or maybe you only want to receive 50 redstone flux at a time. And by doing that, you're going to be allowing your reactant dynamos to build up an internal buffer again because they can't send more than they're producing. Pretty cool. If we bump it up to 100 again, you'll see that they'll start to drain their internal capacitors um, once we allow more energy to flow in. There it goes. So you can do the same with output. Finally, with your hardened energy cells, uh, like I said, you can configure which sides input and output. The side that outputs power is going to be the orange side. So you're going to want to hook up some kind of energy contraption to the side that's connected to the orange piece, and you'll be able to output energy that way. And one last note, you might want to have a little bit of control over these machines. So if you want to, you could turn them on and off using a redstone signal. With the redstone control tab here on any of the thermal expansion machines, not just energy cells, you can tell it to whether it's running when the signal is low, meaning there is no redstone signal applied. So if there's no redstone signal, this machine will continue to run. If you apply a redstone signal, it'll turn it off. You can also set it to high mode, which means it'll be off until you apply a redstone signal. With energy cells, this controls when it's outputting energy, not when it's receiving. So you can see it's still receiving energy. For the reactant dynamos, though, we can see here that we're producing energy. If we said that it only runs when it's receiving a redstone signal, it's no longer producing energy. The power output is zero until we apply a redstone signal with something like a lever. then it's running again. If we say only when it's low, it's not running until the redstone signal is off. And finally, the third option is ignored, which means it doesn't care what the redstone signal is, it's going to run all the time. Your energy conduits do not have an interface, but you can control them a little bit. If you right click on the section of the uh, card conduit here that is connected to either a dynamo or a cell or a machine, you can disable that section so that no longer are we transmitting energy into the hardened energy cell because we've disabled that section. Simply right click with your crescent hammer again to hook it back up. Now the last thing I want to show you guys is forge microblocks are functional with these redstone energy conduits. Pretty cool, right? So what you can see here is that we can cover up these energy conduits using the microblocks. And then if you place, you know, some blocks underneath or above it or on the sides, you'll see that it's all kind of flush and looks pretty much completely normal as if there wasn't anything behind it. So the covers can be used like that. You can also use the covers to prevent connections between two things. So for example, if I place covers like that, it would block these two uh, redstone uh, conduits from connecting. Pretty cool. So, so far we've seen a lot of different ways to generate 
energy some redstone flux right and then we can also store that energy let's see how now to use it so there's a bunch of different machines available out there for you first off let's take a look at the most basic machine in almost any mod that adds technical type machines and that would be the redstone furnace it's basically a furnace and it acts just like a furnace so you can see here that the furnace you can place cobblestone in there and it'll smelt it into smooth stone pretty straightforward not hard at all now the cool thing about these is again we have that redstone control so we can see here whether it receives or doesn't receive redstone if it's set up to only run when it's receiving a redstone signal it won't operate until it receives a redstone signal or you can set it to low or ignored and then it doesn't care what the redstone signal is it's going to run all the time pretty nifty right you can also see on the tab here how much energy it could use so power usage zero redstone flux per tick at the moment um, it has an internal buffer of 24,000 and maximum power 20 redstone flux per tick so you can see it's burning through 20 rf per tick to smelt this cobblestone cool um, if it has a low amount of uh, energy in here it'll use less energy per tick um, in an attempt to conserve power but of course that means it'll also be slower these machines also have uh, an information tab here so you can go over here and see uh, pretty much what this block does and a tutorial about some things pretty cool the last thing is the configuration tab. Remember I told you it was important to keep notes on this because it's going to be useful for you. So you can see this block has many different uh, sides to it with uh, some blue and orange indicators. If you shift click the middle of the block, it'll remove all the settings from the block. And you can see now there's no inputs and outputs. This is how you can get items into and out of the machines. If you set it to blue mode, it'll be uh, accepting items. And if you set it to orange mode, it'll be outputting items. So for example, if we wanted this machine to accept items on the top, perhaps with something like, I don't know, a hopper. We could simply set the blue on the top, place a hopper there, and then anything that goes into the hopper will automatically drop into the machine and start getting smelted. Now if you want to output that item, you can output it in the back into something like a chest. And the orange side corresponds to the output. And this thing will start automatically outputting its smooth stone into the chest behind it. So now we've automated the creation of smooth stone by simply putting any cobblestone directly into this hopper. It gets pumped into the redstone furnace. And then the uh, redstone furnace outputs it into the chest behind it pretty cool right uh, you can of course change this configuration so if we remove this it's no longer going to output anything anywhere or we could if we want to uh, output it to a different side the corresponding sides here are top bottom left for example and right or um, you finally have this one here is the back so we'll set that back to orange and the back side of the block will be outputting items once again and pretty much most of your machines are going to operate this way it's very cool uh, the next option here for a machine is the pulverizer. So let's remove this guy and take a look at the pulverizer. So the pulverizer is your ore doubling technique within uh, thermal expansion. So for example, if we had iron ore, we could drop some iron ore into the pulverizer and it's going to start chewing it up. And what you'll get from that is two pulverized iron dust like so. Now occasionally with a certain percentage chance based on the item that goes in here you might get a bonus item. Uh, so for example we could see this by clicking on this arrow here we'll see what item recipes can come up. So you can pulverize a lot of different things. For example uh, you can pulverize gold you get pulverized gold like that. Uh, with iron you can see here that you'll always get two pulverized iron but you have about a 10% chance to get some pulverized ferrous metal. So 1 in 10 you'll get some pulverized ferrous metal. It's not all the time but it's definitely occasionally going to happen. Pretty cool right? So uh, again with the configuration here you can set your outputs. So let's give this guy a minute to get some pulverized ferrous metal. For now we'll set this guy to accept items on the top and we'll once again output items on the back. But you'll notice right now that only this setting is uh, highlighted and it's orange interesting. So we can output items from this slot uh, pretty easily to the chest behind. If we wanted to we could also output items from the bottom slot to the chest behind by setting the behind slot to yellow like that. And then finally if you wanted to output both of these slots to the chest behind you'd set it to orange mode and now whatever slot is uh, occupied here both of them will output to the chest behind. Pretty cool right? A common configuration with this is to place a redstone furnace right next to a pulverizer and setting the uh, input mode of the redstone furnace on the left and the output mode um, on the right. So let's maybe move this guy. Okay, we'll put this chest right behind this block and we'll set the output to the back. We're accepting items on the left. We'll set this machine to output its items uh, on the right. 
So now that pulverized iron will automatically output to the right side of the block and it'll go into the redstone furnace, which will then smelt and output its items into the chest behind. So this is a nice, easy, automated way to output items. You can also see here that it's not outputting the ferrous at the moment, mostly because there's no room, but also because we don't have it configured to output both slots to the right. You're going to want to set it to orange to make sure both slots output to the right side, and then the ferrous can go in there. On the topic of getting more for less, we've got the sawmill. Uh, a pretty nice item here. You can get yourself some wood. And the wood is going to go straight into the sawmill, and it'll start pulverizing it. So what this does is it'll turn the wood into six planks instead of four, which you would normally get. And as a byproduct of this, you also pretty much 100% of the time get some sawdust. Sawdust can be used uh, to turn it into compressed sawdust. Uh, you can also use it for a couple other things like florbs, which I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, but compressed sawdust can then be smelted into charcoal. So you can get a little bit of extra stuff from your sawdust here, and you'll see that um, you can use that to turn into charcoal, as well as getting six wooden planks instead of four. So it's extra wood, especially useful early game when you don't really have much by way of tree farm set up. Now that we've got that stuff out of the way, let's look at a very unique and specialized machine for thermal expansion, the induction smelter. The induction smelter has quite a few recipes, and you can see here there's a lot you can do with it. Um, basically what you're looking at is a way to, number one, uh, double ore sometimes, and number two, create some very specialized things. So let's take a look at some of the options that you can create with induction smelting. For example, we've got invar. I showed you earlier that you have to get some pulverized iron and some pulverized ferrous and mix them together together manually and then smelt up the dust that you get. Another option is to go ahead and directly get your invar ingots by throwing two iron and one ferrous ingot into your induction smelter. So let's get those going right now. So if we were to get ourselves two iron and a ferrous ingot right here and throw them in there, the induction smelter will cook you up some invar. You also use this machine to get electrum and a couple other important machine uh, type items. Electrum, another uh, item from thermal expansion, you can smelt up some electrum blend or or you can just directly combine silver and gold together in the induction smelter. The electron blend is a pulverized version of gold and silver. You're going to need to use the induction smelter to get yourself hardened glass, which is very useful. Um, it's something you're going to need later down the line. It's some pulverized obsidian and some lead ingots. That'll get you two hardened glass, which you'll use in the future. Next up is the magma crucible. The magma crucible is used for melting down all kinds of different stuff, and it's going to be used to make a lot of the liquids that you can find uh, in the game. So, for example, uh, if you want to get some destabilized uh, redstone here, you can see that um, one option for destabilized redstone is um, getting it out of a squeezer, but we actually want to make the stuff. So the best way to do that is to throw some redstone in a magma crucible. You'll get 900 millibuckets for a block of redstone, uh, which translates, of course, into 100 millibuckets for a single piece of redstone. Cool. So simply place your redstone in here like this, and it'll start melting it down into a liquid version of this redstone. This liquid redstone is used to make a lot of the more advanced items within thermal expansion, like uh, the redstone energy cell and the redstone conduits. So you can see redstone conduits are made by crafting some empty redstone conduits and infusing them with liquid redstone. The same with the um, redstone energy cell. You have to infuse a redstone energy cell frame with about 4,000 millibuckets of destabilized redstone, which is equivalent to about 40 redstone dusts. The way you can infuse things is with the fluid transposer right here. Now a common scenario is to set up them next to each other, output to the right, so we can see this guy is automatically outputting, and accepting items uh, or liquid on the left. So you can see it's importing the destabilized redstone on the left here. Simply place whatever you want to uh, set up in here, like so. You can also fill any bucket with liquid within this machine automatically. So if you wanted to automate the creation of uh, buckets of water, for example, you could pump water into your fluid transposer and automatically fill up buckets. Pretty neat. And again, with the redstone energy conduits, you would place these into the fluid transposer and fill them with destabilized redstone. The magma crucible can make all kinds of cool stuff. You can see here that you can get lava out of cobblestone. Uh, it takes a lot of energy, by the way. It costs 240,000 redstone flux uh, per bucket of lava from a piece of redstone. Uh, you can also uh, turn uh, ender pearls into resonant ender. You can turn glowstone into energized glowstone. And you can do um, some lava out of netherrack or pyrothium dust. 
Uh, lots of different things here. You can also turn cryothium dust into gelid cryothium. So this is the method to create gelid cryothium. Cryothium dust is a combination of saltpeter, snow, redstone, and blizz powder. Uh, blizz powder, I'll show you guys how to make this. It's not too bad. You need to get yourselves a blizz rod. Those are not too easy to get, unfortunately. The blizz is a monster added by thermal expansion. And is he tough, let me tell you. He throws snowballs at you, and he hurts. Quite a bit. And he flies around. And he's mean. Watch out when you guys find these. You'll typically find them in some kind of snow biomes. Uh, trust me if you find them in a small com combination. Oh, they also debuff you with slowness, which is definitely not fun. Um, but yeah, if you find them in a snow biome, especially two or three of them together, they're really a pretty tough fight. Uh, all you have to do to get your gelid cryothium, pulverize your blizz rod, and then you've got your blizz powder. You'll also occasionally get some snowballs from that. Speaking of snowballs, Glacial Precipitator. Have you ever found that snow is just a little bit annoying to get sometimes? Well, if you go ahead and craft yourself a Glacial Precipitator, which isn't really too hard, you'll be able to get a bunch of snow. Uh, now, you'll discover, unfortunately, that you do need a little bit of snow in order to craft this guy, so you do have to find a snow biome before you can start making it. But once you've found one, you've got pretty much a limitless source of snow, snowballs, and ice. Simply go ahead and toss some water in here, and all machines can accept water by right-clicking on them with a bucket, and you'll see the water quickly turns into either snow or uh, snowballs depending on what you choose or ice pretty cool so definitely a neat option for you to create ice or snow pretty much uh, in large quantities automatically cool now one of the last machines that accepts power, there's maybe one or two more, uh, is the Energetic Infuser. This guy is really pretty neat. Uh, there's some tools in the game, uh, especially from some mods and expansions, uh, specifically the Redstone Flux mod, which is also written by the same guys who make Thermal Expansion, creates tools that run on Redstone Flux. Uh, the other thing you can use this with just Thermal Expansion is the creation of what's called the Flux Capacitor. Yep, with a tool or uh, energy system based on Flux, you knew there had to be a Flux Capacitor in there somewhere. Uh, these are basically the batteries of this mod. Uh, the leadstone flux capacitor being the lowest tier, and you can also get hardened, uh, redstone, and resonant flux capacitors. Resonant flux capacitors holding 10 million redstone flux a pop. Um, the redstone one holding 2 million. So they're pretty neat. Just drop them in the blue slide here, and you'll see them starting to generate or uh, fill up with power. And the redstone uh, energetic infuser here can uh, create a lot of it. Actually, it uses quite a bit of energy, especially at uh, top speed. But you'll be able to see that it can uh, do all kinds of cool stuff. It can charge items from the hotbar. So if you've got items that are using the redstone flux, you can put them in the hotbar. And then the other thing that you can do with this guy, which is pretty neat, is uh, let's say we were to get ourselves a pulverizer. If you just wanted to charge an item out in the field here, just drop this into the bottom slot here, and it'll kind of use the energy from the redstone flux capacitor to charge the pulverizer. Pretty cool, right? Now, one of the things about thermal expansion is there's quite a few items here that are uh, not requiring power to run. One of them, for example, is the igneous extruder. This is a pretty nifty block right here, if I do say so myself. Uh, you're going to need some lava and some water buckets, okay? And what these guys do is uh, allows you to create cobblestone, smooth stone, or obsidian, all things that you can create with vanilla Minecraft using a combination of water and lava. For example, smooth stone is pretty much uh, endlessly, or uh, cobblestone is endlessly free within the system. You can create a cobblestone generator in the world. So this guy is definitely um, you know, a lot more efficient, especially for lag purposes. You're not going to be lagging the server too much with a constant uh, creation and breaking of a piece of cobblestone. It's a much more uh, efficient and compact way to generate cobblestone with the igneous extruder. It doesn't use up any of the lava or water. You can also switch this guy to smooth stone mode. It's a little bit slower than the cobblestone generator, but it's going to go ahead and uh, create a piece of smooth stone at the cost of one bucket of water. So all you have to do here is really just keep this guy supplied with water and you'll be able to create unlimited amounts of smooth stone. Pretty straightforward. Uh, and then the final option here is the obsidian, which uses up a bucket of water and a bucket of lava. So for the cost of a steady supply of water and a little bit more time to craft, it'll convert one bucket of lava, one bucket of water into obsidian. That's going to use up both of those guys. And of course, you can pump these in uh, to any side that's got a blue input, and you can configure those as you'd like. I'll show you guys how to transport liquid using thermal expansion, probably in part two of this mod spotlight.
But a nice and straightforward way of generating lots of water is by using what's called the aqueous accumulator. This guy's pretty cool and pretty straightforward. All you need to do is um, go ahead and place him down in the world and he'll slowly but surely create water. You can see it's trickling that water into this inventory right here. What I'll actually do just for demonstration purposes is prevent the output to any blocks and you'll see very slowly but surely it's generating its water. Um, if you want, you can place water around it and I highly recommend it. Two blocks of water touching this thing will significantly increase the creation of water and you'll see now it's a lot quicker to produce the water here. And then uh, of course if you want to you could output it to the left side, it'll drain out and keep this thing filled up. Now with a lot of lava going in here we can keep a steady supply of smooth stone at all times. Pretty cool right? There we go. Now we'll get smooth stone pretty much all the time. It doesn't use up any of the lava and all the water is automatically replaced by the aqueous accumulator. Now there is a couple more things I need to show you guys within this mod, but I think we've pretty much wrapped up this first part of the spotlight. So we'll be back for part two of the thermal expansion mod spotlight, where I'm gonna show you some of the automation machines you can make like the autonomous activator, the terrain smasher, the nullifier. We've also got a machinist workbench and cyclic assembler that I wanna show you guys. And then we're gonna get into um, item and liquid transport. Some of the liquids that are added like the redstone flux and glowstone have some neat properties within the world. There's just a bunch of things to check out still. So we've got a lot more to cover with thermal expansion which we'll have to cover in part two all right guys for now this is direwolf 20 signing off hope you've enjoyed part one of this thermal expansion mod spotlight take it easy